I only have one message to give you. I don't care what you think of me. I don't care what you call me. I do care what you do with this information because it is important to our survival as a species. Okay, listen, this is what I'm what I'm going to do here. Uh, I've been telling you for the past week about my next guest, and I'm going to do my absolute best in the essence of time. This is one busy man who is and I'm I'm going to I'm going to throw the kudos that that are deserved. He is literally serving our nation in ways uh, that, that are not as public as it should be. Uh he's he's operating, I say behind the scenes on on our behalf in the interest of our of our citizens. Uh, he is a, a true patriot, uh, but let me tell you uh, how we've come to know uh, my next guest. His name is Doyle Shamley. He's actually a, a resident in Arizona. He was the research assistant to the legendary William Milton Cooper. And and he's here to discuss today because I wanted to, uh, to speak with him specifically about, and I'm calling it the assassination of Bill Cooper. There is evidence that points to that. Uh, now, there is also conflicting information out there, as you know, in regards to uh, the legendary Bill Cooper uh, that indicated that uh, there was a, you know, there was a shootout with a SWAT team. But there's some evidence, and I know that Doyle Shamley has done his due diligence, as Bill Cooper has always recommended. Do the research yourself and don't believe anything that you haven't researched yourself. But if you don't know who Bill Cooper is, he was one of the most widely known shortwave radio broadcasters. Uh, the broadcast was called The Hour of the Time. It was heard worldwide on the Internet as well. And Bill Cooper may be one of America's greatest heroes. And this story may be the biggest story in the history of the world with respect to his assassination, said uh, a Mills Crenshaw, K-T-A-L-K, in Salt Lake City. Bill Cooper was very controversial at his time because he spoke the truth he was a man that i believe it or not admittedly only came to know right around october or november of last year i had never known of him prior to that somebody had said santilli you're coming out you're trying to search for the truth um uh there's a there's a man named bill cooper you need to listen to him and sent me a couple of links and i was quite frankly blown away by it and Bill Cooper served our nation as well in the military. Uh, he had he had exposure to a lot of things that he wanted to share with the public, and he did so right around 9/11. Uh, prior to 9/11, he was basically not. Uh, he was he was pretty smart. He read the writing on the wall. He knew what was coming that our nation was going to be under attack. And I'm not going to say that he predicted. He essentially saw the patterns that are repeated over and over and over again by our government. He knew what was coming, what was going to happen, and prior to 9-11, he pretty much called it. Shortly thereafter, of course, Bill Cooper was assassinated. He was assassinated on November 5th, 2001. Now, I'm joined, uh, and, and that is, ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, there's so much to say about Bill Cooper and Doyle Shamley. Uh, Doyle Shamley was his research assistant, and I'm pleased and honored that he's coming on the Pete Santilli Show. I want to introduce him to our audience. Doyle Shamley, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you doing, Pete? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Welcome. You know, sir, when I first started talking with you, uh, I remember I was, uh, I, 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 was just, uh, I was just begging to use, you know, the, the voice uh, and the image of Bill Cooper, and I was asking, you know, to, uh, uh, to use, uh, use his information. You were a little bit suspicious of what I was doing, and our show was, uh, quite frankly, it was much smaller than it is now. It's grown by leaps and bounds, sir, uh, because of the work, I believe, that began uh, with, uh, with, Bill, with you and Bill Cooper back then, with the Hour of Time. We are out there searching for the truth. We're providing the truth. And most importantly, everybody is so starved for the truth, Doyle Shamley. They don't know where to get it. We can't get it from our law enforcement. We can't get it from our government. We can't get it from our media. And in some cases, we can't even get it from our alternative media. Don't you agree? Yes, I mean that's certainly the case, and until people do take start taking, you know, solution oriented, proactive. That's like our mantra, if you will, a stance, proactive, solution oriented stance, and start networking cohesively to, you know, have some coordinated efforts amongst themselves, their neighbors, their coworkers, their community, their county, their state. Uh, 
most of the people of this nation will still run around as slaves till the day they die. I mean, they need to draw the line in the sand. The research is, is available. We, ha we, we have a staff that, of researchers, and we do research day and night. And I'm amazed sometimes when I hear from people that, well, I can't get this or I can't get that, and it's, it's so terribly easy, actually. But a lot of people have forgotten or never learned how to do research uh, to begin with because the Internet is, is a tool of distraction, okay? It's like the opiate of the masses, and it's really being used to dumb a lot of people down. Mm -hmm. I have to take young, new researchers all the time and walk them through how to research in a law library or in archives at any of the states, whether they be the county clerks, because you're going to do an elodial title, or you're looking up laws. They don't even know how to do it. And believe it or not, the world is not on the Internet. <laughs> so people need to get a grasp of that again and get roll up their sleeves and get dirty. Freedom isn't easy, and it's not free. <laughs> you're absolutely right. It is certainly not easy. And... It's, it's, it's something that at, at this point in time, I would say in our nation, freedom isn't even really available. <laughs> um, what, what we used to pride ourselves in as far as being a free country, I think those days are gone. We're talking about something years ago that they used to motivate us to go to war. And uh, since then, they've stripped away our, our constitutional rights. Um, wouldn't you say that right now we are, we are no longer a free country? Wouldn't you agree with that statement? Yes, for the better part, correct. Yeah, for the better part. We do have the U.S. Constitution. It's still there. Um, I don't think we fully understand it. It's not taught in our schools. Uh, we don't take the initiative to go out and learn about it. We just say that it's there. We have constitutional rights. But daily, it's being stripped. Uh, Doyle, and, and you see that. You've seen it for many, yeah. many years. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it is. And, uh, and the people carrying forth now, I watched the uh, plutocrats carefully. And uh, people can do this themselves, too. You know, go to the town hall meetings, go to the county hearings, go to the state hearings, and start networking. And that, that's why our research arm is asked continually, three times this week alone by three different congressmen, to turn out reports, because there's a few that are starting to wake up to the realization that we are completely pinched in a corner and the country is about to collapse. And they know that. And uh, get out there and watching some of these younger politicians running for office. I watched one that I was videotaping the seven-person pan panel running for a particular office in the state. And I love the fact that I was running my digital camera on a tripod so my hands are free because of, you know, loonies and, and leftists that like to attend meetings too mm -hmm. in case you got to stomp on someone. But... Uh, this guy said, well, I was sitting at home last night thinking about tonight's debate. When I read about government of the people, by the people, for the people, and the Constitution, I, I was awestruck and realized why I'm here, and I have tears in my eyes. See, that's just typical. He's lying. He didn't read it in the Constitution anywhere. Uh, and he doesn't even know that he's wrong on his reference. He, he couldn't even keep up with his lies. They're so ill-educated anymore. And a lot of us called them on that. Mm. Um, so that that is what's permeating our system. And until the people that are aware and awake are out there networking, doing, again, proactive, solution-oriented, we know what's wrong. We know the economy's collapsing. There's no doubt of a, of a new world order or one world order, or however far back you want to go in terminology. And there's no doubt that most, of all people holding office are simply puppets of the secret government and uh, are viable to be charged and tried and found guilty of treason. So we don't need to talk about that. What we need to talk about is how are we going to combat it oh, head yes. on. Oh, yes. Now... We know it's, we know it's screwed up. We do. So, and let me, let me... I'm going to back us up here uh, because I know you have a super busy schedule. We have... Uh, 40, 45 minutes, and I'm going to go uninterrupted. We're going to skip the break at the top of the hour here. Um, All right. And I want to, I want to, I'm going to pack this in. Now, last year, I spoke with you, and I had, I had actually asked you about, you know, what your thoughts are as to when we are going to be 
uh, heading towards this collapse. We know that we're right on the pl- on the precipice of this collapse. Now, let me back up a second. I've had people tell me, oh, Bill Cooper said that we were going to collapse, you know, back in the, the late 90s. And you know what I say to them, each and every one of them, that if we had collapsed when we were supposed to have collapsed, we could have recovered and we could be a great nation again. And I, I say that if if William Cooper were alive today, if he had seen us go as far as we have come to build up as much debt and to strip away our Constitution to the point to where it is today, I think he'd be even more upset. Yeah, I mean... Uh, seeing the, how, yeah, seeing how far we've come. Because the simple fact is, is that weird. we were crossing the, you could call it the peak of the mountain, if you will, in the 90s, and we were teetering. And eat a little bit downhill or come right back up if we want. Let's say on a recovery mode, as mm-hmm. you in, indicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are now over the precipice of the mountain and hauling ass down the other side. And recovery now is going to be brutal and look drawn out. Uh, we are in the same position that people and like you and I, Pete, and Bill, had been that have been and seen... Uh, collapse of society overseas, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And we are at that point right now. And any scholar, all the PhDs I work with in, in social economics, microeconomics, um, whether it's natural resources or I have several PhDs that are on per, you know, permanent full-time, you could say, for lack of a better word, retainer for the research arm uh, in jurisprudence. And all of us are in agreement. All the historical facts are there. We are getting set up currently for a big hammering Mm -hmm. and a really rough recovery if the people want a recovery. And at this point, most of America does not, quite honestly. I don't think so. And I think it's taken decades of dumbing down, of conditioning. And and Bill Cooper called uh, those individuals that that have basically just submitted to it, this, this enslavement, as the sheeple. And I think they have basically amassed hundreds of millions of people now that are that have been enslaved, that have been dumbed down, and I think they are perfectly ripe to just accept what is about to be delivered to them. Don't you believe that? Yes, I do. Uh, Mm -hmm. The bulk, the bulk of America that talks big on the internet behind you know made up names uh, doesn't have the balls to grab a gun and stand up for anything. Mm -hmm. The bulk of them don't have the food stores they talk about or the skills they talk about. That's why we have continual year-round seminars and classes on those topics, for instance. And uh, besides just the more academia, but also the hands-on stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you know that, Pete. Mm -hmm. Uh, Look at any chat room in America. It's not. It's it's at least three quarters blowhard. Yeah. And. uh, very and cora- that's what the country's looking at. Very the courageous people, behind their, their anonymity. Very courageous behind their anonymity, aren't they? Yeah, and the bulk of the people will uh, do whatever they need to do. Boston was a perfect dry run. If you want a litmus test of the American people, as the police forces moved down the streets and said, stay in your you know, houses and quiver and... Don't come out and do this and drive in these times or don't drive at all. Uh, it was just another dry run, as was the FEMA practices at the Astrodome after Katrina. And uh, they are discovering, and, and it's enough now to have actual anecdotal and empirical evidence for the people setting for our downfall, that we are to a point that we're very ripe for the picking. Oh, yes. Now, it, sir, it'll be that it'll be like the American Revolution, where depending on what historian you want to, you feel most comfortable with or believe in, but mm-hmm. they all have the same parameters of three to seven percent of the country fought the revolution. Do you think? And it'll do you be think the same in trying to restore our republic? Here, here's one of the biggest questions I have to ask you, and we'll probably cover this again uh, before we. I, I want to transition back to uh, the work of, uh, of Bill Cooper, but. Do you think that we can muster up that three to seven percent? Because I, I really do. I have faith that we have that three to seven percent that is going to be able to save us. We have some some heroes. There's a by the way, I want to bring up a name. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Roy Potter. 
Okay, and he's come out within the past month to call yeah. it exactly the way he sees it. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. Patriots like that who are stepping forward from uh, retired military, uh, from retired law enforcement, from active duty military and active duty law enforcement. Patriots that are going to step up and say enough is enough. Do you think we can muster up that support to really defend our nation, defend our constitution, and save our save our country and our people? Yes, we can, and it, but it is going to be barely a three to seven percent margin. So that's why people need to, you know, take a harsh, realistic look at those around them. Mm-hmm. And it is a harsh and and uncomfortable look at their family members. You know, when I say that, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, whatever, and uh, their friendships and coworkers, and they need to just be realistic and accept the fact that. Three to seven percent of everybody they're engaged with throughout their life, which isn't that many if you look statistically, are all that's going to be there for their back. And they need to get into the, really, the time-saving mode if you want. And people need to face the fact today that you need to write off the dead weight. The anonymous talkers, the bullshit artists, and all them, just write them off because there becomes a point when... The old adage of leading a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Yes. Well, you know, trying to force them horses to drink after a while becomes futility. And really verges on the definition of insanity, if you will. Oh, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, at a point, those proactive alliances that are geared up, and, and many of us are doing it, Pete. Uh, I am in daily contact with the sheriffs all over the country. That were, you know, and you know, I held those seminars to teach sheriff's jurisdiction in the Western U.S. Yes, sir. And the National Constitutional Sheriff's Association all last fall and all up and down the 28 counties in October alone. And with that, myself and many of us veterans have been really coordinating a lot of activities around the country. Uh, Warrant officers dusting off their old books and skills again and NCOs, et cetera, all around the country. Awesome. Uh, we can do it, but it's going to be a tight one. It's, it's going to be a tough slog, and it's going to be, unfortunately, because if we had paid attention and, and we had responded to the warning signs that Bill Cooper and yourself, uh, in educating the public the way you did, if we'd responded to it back then, it wouldn't be as bloody of a battle as I anticipate. But let's, let's not ponder uh, what, yeah. what uh, I mean, it's going to be a tough slog for us, absolutely. But that's our fault. Shame on us. For not responding when we should have. But back in the late 90s, um, you and Bill Cooper were working very, very hard to educate those that wanted to be educated. Uh, and I also yeah. tell our listenership right now, never trust anybody. Uh, get a hold of, read and listen to everything you can get your hands on and never believe anything that you haven't researched yourself. Yeah. And that, that was, was that your, from behind the scenes, can you tell us, was, was that your mantra? That was your goal? You knew what was coming, and you knew what the people needed to know, and that was the advice to give them then. That's still the same advice we need to give people these days, right? Yeah, you know, certainly. I mean, I remember it, it was a daily routine to have people, we're sitting in the studio uh, all hours, day and night, as you guys do, and uh, I know you do, so... Um, and yep. you get all these numerous emails, phone calls, whatever, of the newest uh, UN troops that are right in the backyard. And you say, well, then send us a picture. Or the newest FBI operation doing this or that. Mm-hmm. And it was a daily occurrence for us to take these rumors and chase them down. Call the FBI field station and find out. Right. What they're doing right there, you know, over in North Carolina or something, you know, depending on what we were told. And, and we spent, and we, except for cutting off the dead weight, which we've done aggressively over the last two years, us and all the original CAGI and IS staff, um, but it was, it's still the same. 80% of your time is spent up trying to get people back on track because it comes back down to that laziness and apathy. Mm-hmm. It's easier to just hit forward on an email or a text if you have one of those phones or whatever and not do any research, and that rumors just promulgate. And all the while, people are chasing their tail and dodging pieces of the falling sky. They're not getting any solu- 
solution-oriented things going. Uh, I would say the bulk of that stuff is started by agent provocateurs. Yep. I mean, I'm confident in it. We already know that they're using social media uh, throughout the world, but especially in the U.S. heavily. Mm -hmm. And if you don't just go out and do the simple research, and then when you find out something's false, then stop it. Don't hit that forward button to 400 more people. Right. Because you're only adding. You're only helping the enemy. That's right. They have mastered since, uh, and in the mid '90s, that's when the the internet really started coming about. You had access to, you know, the world's. I called it the world's largest library with the books scattered all over the floor. You had to use, you know, some pretty good skills and some some pretty good um, uh, discretion when you went out and took a look at the information. Now they've mastered since then. They've mastered the art of disinformation to confuse you and send you in so many different directions that you pretty much just give up. Uh, but uh, let, let, let me let me go back to that time and, and, and really start digging into this because I, I know that uh, you need to move along. Uh, you and your researchers and Bill Cooper were onto some stuff just prior to 9-11. You saw where the country was going. You saw the banking system should have collapsed back then. Uh, I think 9-11 w- gave them the opportunity to kick the can down the road with trillions of dollars in military industrial complex revenue, uh, war money, essentially. But yeah, but you, you saw the writing on the wall. You saw the patterns that the nation goes through, uh, through false flag attacks. False flag attacks occurred back then. Bill Cooper uh, uh, talked about it, and he called 9-11 just prior to 9-11. And it wasn't because he was a clairvoyant. It's because he did the research himself. He saw the patterns. He analyzed it. And he, what tipped him off that 9-11 was coming about? What was the one thing that tipped him off? It wasn't a gut feeling. It was from the research that you guys did, correct? Yeah. It, it was the culmination of, of watching, you know, getting it to this day is still the same. Tremendous amount of data in and starting to see the pattern of a gearing up of, A, we need something that will be a false flag attack on our soil, but we're still facing the repercussions of, if you will, uh, of very little, but of Waco and Ruby Ridge. So we can't go that route. It needs to be a foreign boogeyman. And as was discussed post war, you know, even pre World War II, actually, the UFO thing didn't quite work out. And then Eisenhower and mo- multiple peoples wanted, you know, this outside alien force. The Vatican, I've got reports on from the Vatican that, you know, talking about, uh, they call it astrotheology. There's a whole field of study in the Vatican on it. Hmm. Those didn't quite work out, so the best way was watching the intel was the heavy troop movements and the political posturing that was going on through the lending power. That grant-making authority, which controls most of everybody's life in America, is also the same way via one of the most corrupt at-arms of our government throughout history, our U.S. State Department, one of the most communist infiltrated agencies. Hmm. And always has been. They use that Lynn lease power to distort the fabric of a society. They were hammering that region in the Middle East. They had their boogeyman picked. They had already been talking about Osama and intelligence wires and reports. So you could tell they had the name picked and who they were going to pick to be the boogeyman. And they went ahead with it. And you, you could just pretty much just plot it. See the writing on the wall. You analyzed it. Uh, you saw 9-11 coming. Bill Cooper went forward. What was the one thing that he said? There was a day when he said, man, this is going to take place. We are right on the precipice of this thing. When do you think that was? Do you have just a general time frame prior to 9-11 when he called it and said, this is going to happen here? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, yeah, I was sitting around the back porch barbecuing a bunch of us, actually, of the studio. Uh, back about February-ish, March of that year. February would be most accurate because there was still tons of snow on the ground and everything. And and what what did he what did he say? What did you folks uh, say? You said, "Man, we we can just see this thing coming. Something's going to happen here." Yeah, and it was basically that on this one, this is where they will. The discussion was this attack will be the the stimulus. It'll be the ideology. Change. It'll be everything for a rewriting of our fabric. 
of this country. It'll be the Homeland Security. You know, the old Patriot Acts updated? Right. Be the Homeland Security Acts. It'll be your Patriot 2 and Patriot 3 that Clinton and, the, and Reno had wanted and didn't get through. It'll be the stimulus for so, for so much catastrophic level change to the fabric of our country that there's no choice but to put it out there because people need to know now. Mm-hmm. If you have some intention of doing X, Y, Z, that whether that be grabbing a bunch of silver or more food or going to some class, an EMT class or something to make your community or family safer, you need to do it now. That's kind of how it culminated. Imagine an epiphany, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's just a thousand factors working into a formula, and then suddenly the using that example, the math, math the mathematics just became clear. Now there there was so information. That last push was also why so aggressively we were digging out of the research center. All the all of our oldest, rarest esoteric writings, and that's why so many of those broadcasts that we would spend during the day, you know, writing and proofing mm-hmm. notes, uh, were coming out. The mystery of Fulcanelli, and so many of those broadcasts were in those last few months of his life, mm-hmm. because it was the the need for urgency that this information, the most cutting edge, as always had been done, but it needed to come out at a, at an amount that was like an avalanche because there was no time left. And, and his, history has been written that everything uh, that you folks had prepared for, everything you saw coming, actually uh, came to fruition through 9-11. Our, our world mm-hmm. was changed. Our, our nation was changed instantly uh, with that one mm-hmm. event. Yep, no doubt about it. And ironically, that, you know, and a segue into that is was last week I contacted one of the older, older IS people and Kaji people that I talked to weekly, but he was just discussing how some articles that we said, okay, it has happened now, so here's this, this, and this is now going to come next, mm-hmm. and how they were digitizing and remastering broadcasts from 01 and 02 and 03, that, that whole era right there. Right. And they were just dumbfounded from the o, even the O2 and O3 broadcast. They're like, everything the staff called was still dead on accurate. It has happened. Oh, yeah. You know, we exposed Operation, you know, Magic Lantern, they called it, and Golden Keystroke, and everybody called us kooks. And finally, eight years later, it, then people were wanting to talk about it more. Oh, yeah. And the data mining and harvesting, they finally, six, eight years later, were wanting to talk about it. So it, it's a sad path, uh, you know, but it's one of those deals, somebody's got to do it. Oh, yeah. There was, yes, now now let me let me take us back to just prior to 9-11. Some information come about, everyone's doing their research, Bill Cooper's calling it. Uh, just prior to 9-11, he came across some information and said, this is going to take place here within a relatively short uh, uh, time frame. Mm-hmm. Uh, did he did he have some inside information that said, this is coming, it's going to take place? Did he have that? Yeah, essentially, yes. Okay. So he Final came... distillation of that that example earlier, like a, a, you know, a, a, a thousand different sources of data mm-hmm. were coming together with no ifs, ands, or buts. There is no alternative A, B, or C left. Right. It's all going down track A. Now, did had uh, he received any pressure from outside sources to, to not be talking about this information? Um, was he receiving any death threats? Were you guys receiving any death threats uh, because of the topics you were covering? normal monitoring, and yes, the normal death threats, and that's a continual thing, but the monitoring was escalated as well. Okay. Um, after the murder... Upon doing multiple, every direction, you know, uh, whether they be public information requests or FOIAs, depending on what kind of agency you're dealing with, Mm -hmm. they're basically the same thing. Um, Then there was files of, back then, floppies, little three-and-a-half-inch floppies. Right. They're still very common back then. And um, of everything, even the most mundane activities. I was pumping gas in our truck 
at Circle K. I mean, everywhere we went and moved. That accelerated heavily, I will say, the end of May of, of that year, and then really amped up at the end of August. So at the end of August, they were on you. You had people surveilling you. Um, and then 9-11 took place. And then, obviously, I mean, um, what what was, uh, I mean, on 9-11, obviously, uh, Bill Cooper did excellent, excellent reporting. I've listened to those recordings. I mean, served our country in ways that uh, we're just now really coming to appreciate as everybody wakes up to this stuff. Um, but you guys weren't weren't really shocked you were you still it, it sounded like you were just carrying on with the same exact plan everyone needs to wake up this is what's happening um let, let's call it the way we see it do your own research uh so so bill cooper was hot and heavy on continuing to educate the public on the truth and 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 then shortly thereafter some some things changed uh with respect to how they were coming at uh, at bill cooper what what happened that led up to his i'm calling it his assassination at this point uh-huh. it was his murder what 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 turned? Was there any turn of events that took place, or was it just a sudden? That's it. It just happened. No, there. I will say. Well, it's a little of both. It's it's such a screwed up situation. But to give you an idea, uh, originally, uh, you can see in the state reports that were done by the Department of Public Safety, uh, your Highway Patrol. Okay, in other words. Mm-hmm are typically called in on homicides, not typically, always. Here's the theory. They're not a local police. They're not a local sheriff. They don't, you know, live down the road type of thing. Right. So you get a more unbiased reporting. It came out in those 300-plus pages of initial reports from the state of Arizona following, because it was deemed a homicide on the death certificate even, uh, of bills that, the initial raid was planned for 9-11. Was it really? On page three. And we, we did tons of broadcasts on that very subject. The initial raid was on 9-11. That was the planned date. And due to security concerns and I'm saying their words, okay? Due to security concerns and heightened activity of that day, the 9-11 raid on Bill was called off. And the biggest part of that is the fact that we were live for 10 hours straight. How are you going to run into a a studio? You yeah. know, I'm talking drive up, do yard, do right. massive troops, uh, not troops, but you know what I mean. Right. And, and do all that if someone's live and, and do it without it being live. Right. Whether Waco or Ruby Ridge, that they, because of PR, quite honestly, they were trying to avoid that type of situation again with right. anybody, not just him. They want to do it more subtly behind the scenes. What was the justification for the raid? What was the, um, what were the, they had warrants, obviously, they were going after him for, on, on what grounds? Well, there's multiple sets of, of, warrants, if you will. Many of them have been called off, even, as time went by. Mm -hmm. Everything from uh, assaulting some citizens locally, to threats and intimidation, to uh, the whole federal marshal thing, wanted list that had started uh, on us back in 98, 1998, because Mm -hmm. of that jurisdictional piece we wrote, Mm -hmm. and had delivered to every member of Congress and Clinton and Janet Reno and all of them, certified mail return receipt. Uh, and uh, we all signed it and had that delivered. That was one big amplitude. That's 1998. Right. And then as it got closer, there was an amassing of all these other figures. They were There was court orders for supposed back alimony from a former wife from 20 years ago that Mm. had been upgraded to felonies. I mean, it's unbelievable when you read all the reports Mm -hmm. how much was amassed that summer to try to tie in this and create this story, if you will, Mm -hmm. this picture of this crazy 
psycho that's got this whole trail of outstanding warrants behind him. The mechanizations were powerful, and they had unlimited time and, and resources. And But the main push, pulse, was some uh, supposed uh, threats and intimidations with, you know, even indicating, like, death that Bill had supposedly made, mm-hmm. uh, including following a family clear to their driveway in town. Mm. That this, was supposedly the, the main stimulus at that point. And, and this is all false information? Uh, much of it, yes. Much of it, okay. So so basically it was in, and we, you and I know, and everybody should know, that it was in direct retaliation uh, yeah. for him wanting to expose the truth about a lot of things. He basically was being retaliated against. They were coming up with all kinds of things that they could justify uh, a raid on. So they... They, they wanted to do it on 9-11. They had to hold off on that. And then uh, November uh, 5th came, and they executed uh, that raid. And where were you at the time? Down the street. You were down the street. I just, uh, oh, the last two years, I would say, of his life. But yeah, it was actually about 18 months. I had my own place just, oh, 700, well, let's say 1,000 yards away. Mm-hmm. But down the street in a country town of eager isn't like down the street in la there's right. a mountain and a and a river and a culvert and three bends and 700 foot difference in elevation you know what i mean yes yes now um, d- did you know anything so, was going on in your in your neighborhood huh did, did, did you know anything was happening in your neighborhood at the at the time they executed the raid Oh, nobody did. And in fact, uh, as we talked about heavily in the tons of broadcasts we've done and, and the DVD, et cetera, on the top, this topic, mm-hmm. um, the eager police chief had dismissed multiple attempts from outsiders. The state of Oklahoma, because we trained Timothy McVeigh, was still hot and heavy wanting to serve warrants, and he refused it on jurisdictional grounds because he had learned from us, too, and uh, whether it was for the broadcast or just in the community or at speaking engagements. And uh, he had basically written them off, these accusations, and Eager wouldn't engage him, the police force. They said, he's just the town eccentric. Mm -hmm. Leave it at that. Right. So the police force, the Eager police, weren't even up there till it was done. They were called more around 1 in the morning for an 11.45 at night incident and told, oh, by the way, you've got a resident dead. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Now, most importantly here, and I want to I want to just pause right now because when I had asked you to come on to talk about this, uh, you, you were absolutely correct, and I want to share this with our entire listening audience, that all of this information is out there, that, that all of the research that has been done into the assassination of Bill Cooper is well-documented. And shame on all of us for not having done all of that research because we're all very fascinated by what you're talking about. We're very interested. Uh, we want to know the facts, but the facts are right there before us. All we need to do is to, as if you don't mind me saying so, you said everyone needs to get off their ass and do the research themselves. And I will discuss it this one time, but the main message that we need to convey to everybody is you do the research yourself and you will believe what you have before you. Yeah. Versus us serving it up to them. So this is all well documented. Um, oh, yeah. And I, like I say, like today's broadcast for you, Pete, you know, no problem. And uh, your cohort there, I'm so sorry, I forgot her name. Susanna Cole, I, yes. Mm-hmm. I, I apologize That's for okay. that. But, That's okay. Um, the, you know, we had discussed this till we beat the dead horse into a mummy and back into dust. I mean... And, and people say, well, I didn't hear this, but I heard eight, these 18 interviews you did on the topic. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean you didn't hear it? I mean, we've given you the time frames, the reports. Uh, on the website is the Hold a Pell Horse book, audio book, and Oklahoma City, the original as, in, as published. Uh, there's some hacks out there who have distorted some of the publications actually mm-hmm. like they're fond of doing to the audios mm-hmm. and right there's the toxicology report right there's the autopsy report i don't know how to make it any simpler yes sir just yes, a sir. pitiful state of people 
It, so it is. I, but for you and your request, I said, yeah, well, I'll talk about it one more time. And, and this I is, think the most mm-hmm. telling things are the fact that people that, you know, when Tex Mars was about to lose everything, and, and uh, we were the only ones in the studio saying it doesn't matter what his personal life or beliefs are. He has the right to say what he's saying about Jews or banking or whatever, because mm-hmm. he's done the research and he's saying it like he saw it and what he at least has proven out in his research. Mm-hmm. Some of the few people in America defending him when he was at his lowest point in that 98 to 2000 era, mm-hmm. he comes out with uh, that, that synopsis of Bill's murder in his book and, uh, you know, he's always claimed in his books that he does this thorough research, and if somebody has a correction, he'll acknowledge it. Right. Well, he didn't acknowledge it. He just republished it after hordes of people over a two-year period mm-hmm. hammered him. Yeah, Tex Mars made no attempt to get an accurate story. He published that Bill was at a stoplight in town driving and was approached by the police, and this led into a car chase through the stoplight and to the house, mm-hmm. he published total horseshit is what he did. Mm. And later, finally, when enough people hammered him, and I and several of these people sent me scans of their certified return receipt letters, pointing it out to him, so they had proof that he received their mail right. around the country. And I didn't orchestrate any of it because I could care less about him or his book and lies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. Because everybody was doing it. Commander X, everybody making up stories to get famous. Right. uh, Off of his death. And he finally changed it, but when you get one of the newer editions of the book, and it doesn't say errata, which is standard English forever in professional and technical writing Mm -hmm. with an update and correction. It's just changed to be more correct. So it never looks like he ever did publish that total bullshit. Um, that's just fact. And that went on all over. The uh, Anthony Hilda rushed right to the ConCon, the conspiracy convention. Mm-hmm. And we're regular invitees of that. And we chose not, we chose to quit going. Right. And he ran right to that after the funeral in the Bay Area with all sorts of glamorous writing. Let, let's, uh, if uh, we could. Know, so several people mm-hmm. that had been in the genre, if you will, for decades right. around us. Uh, it's a, it's disgusting how low they will stoop to twist stories and put out fallacies and glamorizations to extend or expand their sphere of influence or careers on the death of somebody. Unbelievable. Yeah. Sir, let's go back and give, uh, uh, if you could, for, based on your research, and the research that everyone else who is interested in knowing the truth can go do themselves. But... Um, the um, the events that led up to um, uh, to to Bill Cooper's uh, death. He came out of his house from 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 what I understand. Uh, they did not want him going back inside when they showed up at his property. He was outside of his house. Is that correct? Can you give us a brief synopsis of what took place when he was when he was shot? Yeah, the long and short of it is was a Chevy pickup, just a plain Jane truck, uh, unmarked. In other words. Uh, pulls up at 11.30 at night, blasting music, okay, uh, at the end of this cul-de-sac opposite his home. And, and his uh, bedroom was upstairs. And using the plant that they had, which was his long-lost daughter, who drew articulate maps and gave detailed descriptions, she was only there to backstab her father mm. in the reports. And then she used his death to get famous afterwards, Jessica, when in reality all she did was run and squawk to the law enforcement the layout of the home and the, his habit. And it's all in the report, signed wow. by her. Uh, his, his bedroom was upstairs. So, you know, imagine just looking out of a very tall second story and seeing up the way. And this was a common occurrence with maybe high school kids wanting to go out and do whatever on a Friday night and go chase him off. So he went down there to confront him, and when they wouldn't leave that Chevy pickup, 
uh, and you know, we've got to realize no street lights, nothing. This is real rural America, like sure. all America should be. Mm-hmm. And so you tur- he turns around and he even told him, I'm going to go back and call the police. So he turns around and I guess it's that, that was the signal. Like, oh shit, we're busted. Because remember, they haven't involved eager police, as I said earlier. Right. And here he's saying he's going to go call them. So that's when he had just turned around, and initially some goons came out of bushes to his left on the hillside Mm -hmm. uh, on foot and ran at his door and then stopped, and he put his hands out, kind of open-palmed. And then at that point when they accelerated or retook up movement towards him, Mm -hmm. Uh, he threw it into gear and floored it. One of them was jumped up. It was a step side pickup Bill had, a blue Chevy step side. So they jumped up on the little running board. And, you know, well, they want to reach in and yank your shifter into park. So right. he got thrown off with all. He didn't get ran over, barely scratched. And Bill jumped up, kind of went over a little hump and ripped out his exhaust system getting back to the home, mm-hmm. maybe a cumulative 350 yards. Mm-hmm. All this is occurring in. Well, under in that back of that truck, they had plenty of manpower. They actually had the two people in front, the appearance of partiers to lure him out of the home. Right. In the middle of the night with the loud stereo. They even had a personnel laying in the floorboards and under a tarp, five more in the back of the truck. Wow. Okay. Besides what had been moving around the periphery of the property in the dark. Right. So when he gets up in front of the house, he's just locking it up at kind of an angle, you know, like how you would in an emergency. Right. And he gets out and is going towards the front door, and that's when the shooting began. There's a lot of indications that one deputy shot the, the other deputy, who's Marina's, that got injured and Bill, it was blamed on Bill. Mm-hmm. Because of the layout, the crime scene reporting done by that, I told you, DPS. Right. Uh, because of the angles. And they reported that Bill swung his 38 sub nose backwards, his right hand, mm-hmm. just backwards as he hobbled forward. Now, remember, this is a one legged man with the prosthesis. Yes, sir. That every day I had to caretake mm-hmm. his sub. Mm-hmm. He didn't, Bill didn't run anywhere, mm-hmm. is the point. But he was moving quickly. Right. Now, when you swing your right arm back, to shoot, imagine if you just do this while I'm talking, you can't hit a guy if you're facing 12 o'clock and you're pointed back, pulling the trigger, you're about 4 or 5 o'clock. You can't hit a guy at 1 o'clock to you. And that's where that one particular deputy Marinas was hit. Hmm. Uh, eventually, Bill did get hit, and we did a we did a whole autopsy audio, as I'm sure you're aware of, because it got kind of famous, from yes, with an uh, bonafide autopsy expert. Mm-hmm. And there was stippling evidence. Now, stippling only occurs from those unburned or still burning flakes of powder coming right. out of the end of any muzzle. Right. And it can only appear within 16 inches of the target. So there, So when they got him down, then there was multiple close-range shots right at the body because there was those little unburned powder flakes causing that stippling on his skin. At point blank. Basically, yeah. That is considered point blank when you have stippling. Right. And uh, and because of the angles of them, and you can track the course of events in a good autopsy, and, mm-hmm. and we were able to do that on our famous broadcast about this, um, he already had a fatal catastrophic wound. And multiple shots occurred, even at point blank, by legal definition, uh, after the catastrophic, you ain't moving nowhere. You're not twitching. You're not responding. You're down and out. Right. And that was right shy of the four-foot concrete walkway to the front door. Mm-hmm. Ed was laying just inches away from the rock border. Mm-hmm. And when eager police was finally called, two hours later, that, oh, you've got a resident dead, by the way, in your town. In the report show that in case of any fatalities, the attackers had even prearranged with the ambulance services that if they were to come through town, not to run sirens. Hmm. 
you know, that way people aren't getting woke up. Right. And um, when the next thing I know, there's flashing lights coming into my home down the way. Right. Sorry to always talk like a redneck, but. No, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Everybody so should. so <laughs> that was instant alarm, what's going on. And it was one of the local police that I knew. I mean, I knew them all. I know them all still. Right. And uh, he was walking up to the door. Well, I knew something was wrong, obviously. And those lights were barricades that had been put, were getting put up at the end of the road by one of those agencies that was involved mm -hmm. to block off my road. And he was approaching, telling them, what, are you guys dumbasses or what? That's basically, there was the sum of it out the end of the street. Mm -hmm. And came up to my house and said, I came out and said, what are you doing? What's going on? Because you just know. Right. They don't just come to your home for the heck of it. Yes, sir. You know, mm -hmm. and, with, and with lights and shit. So I said, what's going on, Frazier? And he says, let's sit down here on the porch. And I said, yeah, grab a seat. And he had his, his blue windbreaker that said police on. That's mm -hmm. rare. That's mm -hmm. little towns. Mm -hmm. And he says, Bill's being murdered. And I said, what? Mm. I mean, he's like, what do you mean? I said, what do you mean? And he says, and he gave me a brief rundown of this mm -hmm. on the spot. And said, now we're protecting you because they wanted to come after you. So we've got an officer assigned to you. And, and, and it, they did keep their word and did that. Mm. And uh, he said, they told us in our briefing at one in the morning when we, the chief finally got the call and called me as the only detective on the force. It's just a shared duty reality on a small force. And we went up there. They said, we did not want another Waco or Ruby Ridge. So we weren't going to allow him to get in the house alive. Yeah. Because he could call me. Right. Or he could get or link up with WBCQ, you know, get right. on the Comrex and go right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, they had never had an intention of him getting back in the home alive. So there's your synopsis. They uh, they protected you at that point, And thank goodness they did, because you're you're here to, um, you know, you're here to tell the story and he'll, here to, uh, of course, uh, you have for many years to, to tell the Tell the truth, of course, um, but but you you have not. Uh, and thank you very much for sharing that. And ladies and gentlemen, most importantly, the reason why we're documenting this and 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 Doyle Shamley has said, uh, you know, Pete, I'll do it for you. Uh, we, we have actually honored uh, Bill Cooper on a daily basis, and uh, because of that, Doyle is willing to share this story one last time. But we want to encourage each and every one of you, just as Bill Cooper encourages us, and he did for many many years. Uh, do the research yourself. Don't believe anything that you have not researched yourself. Don't trust anybody. Go out there and do it yourself. The information is there for you. That's the main message we want to communicate here. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, a real quick aside, because that even saying they protected me is kind of a, that technically wouldn't be the right term, but mm -hmm. the long and short of it was, was there was helicopters over my house at under 100 feet as the day went on. Mm -hmm. Snipers stationed on hills. Mm -hmm. and numerous outside forces coming. Mm -hmm. So like when they when the these outside agencies were going to use a robot to blow the front of the house off to enter because they were told that we had planted that me and Bill had planted landmines and booby traps all over. Mm. I said, dude, that he's got two little fatherless daughters now and I am the head fiduciary and the chief backed me up on it. And said, he's, he's right, and you can't break their common law trust, and he is the fiduciary. So I said, don't be blowing the damn front of the house off, you idiots. That's the only thing they're going to have. At least let them go to college on it or something. Right. I mean, Jesus. So they like, they took me to that meeting in the eager police car. Mm -hmm. And when some of the agencies, they were just being assholes, Pete. You know how they are. Yeah. So, like, they said I couldn't finish my cigarette when I was in their meeting room. Their incident command center, they called an ICC. Sure. They set up, like in a trailer. Right. I said, fine. I put it out in his cup of coffee. <laughs> Good for you. Good and, for you. Uh, <laughs> so they get a little pushy, and uh, that's that's when, like, in the, in, uh, he would kick in, the eager officer, mm -hmm. and say, well, we're leaving now. Come on, Doyle. And then just park on my road, just right next to the house. Right. To keep. Everything else at bay, yeah. you know, what's going to come out of the helicopter? 
what right. news media is just going to show up, you right. know, things like that. Right. So, you know, protection, I, you know, it may or may not be the right word, but you yeah, get their, the gist now. Their, pr their presence uh, could possibly have, have saved your life, just their mere presence. Yeah, alone. I mean, well, yeah. I'm confident, yes. ultimately, because this, you know, this place was swarmed upon. Schools were shut down upon outside advisement from state agencies mm -hmm. uh, because we were... I was going to make the call, and the policemen that were running a barricade for the crime scene mm -hmm. asked me, because it was a horrible monsoon, the sky turned black, everything. We have monsoons, they're normal, but it really came down that day like something out of a, a, a twilight zone. Wow. Like they had brought evil to the town. Oh, yeah. You know, like that type of scenario. Mm -hmm. And I was up there, when are you done? When are you going to be done? When are you going to be done? Every 20 minutes. <laughs> and... uh at the barricade, and they said, Doyle, are you going to make that call? Because I'm just here running a barricade, and I don't feel like trying to have a shootout with 10,000 militia members. <laughs> and I said, where'd that come from? And it was more of that behind-the-scenes report from supposed friends of Bill's. One, one particular friend uh, that Bill talked about on the air even, uh, he had allowed, allowed, knowingly allowed and gave permission for his phone to be tapped for that last year of Bill's life hmm. and then would call Bill every day so he could, and then that way Bill was not suspicious of a daily phone call right. from someone he thought was a friend, mm -hmm. Dave Mann. And uh, that way they were constantly recording all the phone conversations. Hmm. I mean, all this came out afterwards when you right. could start getting reports. So, so, Doyle, so Doyle, the um, and thank you very much for sharing uh, that with us. The, the, the system, the system went after Bill Cooper. We had a bunch of law enforcement people, whether they be with whatever three letter agency, um, yeah. the DPS, the FBI, the IRS. It doesn't even matter. The system no. itself, with all of these individuals thinking that they're serving their country in a law enforcement capacity, they're probably you know, good Americans, and they're only fed certain information, but the system itself went after Bill Cooper for him telling the truth about a lot of things they didn't want the public to know about, correct? Isn't that a pretty safe assumption? Yes, and one of the other very telling things that people seem to have forgotten from our past broadcast, so I'm going to take advantage of you and this offer and get it out again, is Officer Goldsmith, who it's felt maybe it shot the fatal wound, not the point blank one, the fatal one, mm -hmm. and Haynes shot to the heart region and things like that. Right. He he was the one that's most in line on the schematics of the crime scene, which the schematics jive, getting to see like tape and brass casings. Mm -hmm. He was the one most in line to hit this officer marinas not bill as i described earlier mm -hmm. about a month after the incident officer goldsmith went to his leadership and said dude we need an in we need some internal investigations i've got a lot of trepidations about that day and they said oh it's just ptsd take another day off and go home and forget about it mm -hmm. and he pushed the issue again we need to have some kind of like large scale outside agency complete audit, for lack of a better word, of what happened that night. Sure. I think he himself kind of knew he might have shot the other officer, and I think his morals were finally kicking in. Mm -hmm. at some point here, because you know he had just been fed that here's this guy with fifty warrants or whatever mm -hmm. of shit. So, uh, and he obviously was getting to see details as time went on, just like us. Sure. All of a sudden, next thing you know, one of our local National Guard units is coming home from the Middle East, a tour, mm -hmm. and there was a welcome home parade, and he was in this motorcycle cavalcade, the welcome home, and I saw him at a little lunch break here on a big bus coming back from Fort Steele, demoving, and then they were headed over the mountain to their hometown, and he's part of this cavalcade, and an unknown hit, an unknown suspect it was never solved, came out and ran over him. <sighs> that officer. Wow. That was for an inquiry. The one that was demanding the inquiry and, and, and mm -hmm. into the incident that he was involved in. That's remarkable. Uh, it, yeah. And it traumatized his wife, and she tried to approach me about a month after his death. Mm -hmm. 
they're locals, mind you. Right. Or were, past tense. And she, she wanted to talk to me bad and in tears. And she somehow dug up my number through the police, I assume, and called the home. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. So I called a deputy to go with me uh, to watch my back. Right. And at that point, when I called her back and said, okay, we're going to meet in this very visible Circle K parking lot (laughs) and talk. Right. Didn't know if it was another setup. Um, Then at that point, when I, within just a small matter of time, maybe three hours went by, and I'm going to call her back to tell her, yeah, I'll meet you at 5, and you can tell me whatever's on your chest. Um, she suddenly had changed views. Something got to her or somebody, mm-hmm. and she says, I can't meet you. I can't talk about it. And when I was doing follow-up research for the people that made the documentary on Bill mm-hmm. in that day, part of that, knowing they were coming, uh, I was down at the state huge library in Phoenix, and uh, doing the microfilms, and the desk clerk was helping me. And I said, I need everything that even mentions 96 North Clearview Circle, Bill Cooper, William Milton Cooper, whatever form. I need it, and anything that's in this time frame. Mm -hmm. And he's pulling up the records. He goes, oh, dude, this is on the notification list. I said, what are you talking about? And we had done a broadcast on how libraries are part of the snitch system, as you know. Right. If you check out certain books, they're supposed to report to the Fed <laughs> who you are. And it really was accelerated after 9-11, that program. Mm-hmm. Well, he says, I'm supposed to alert the authorities that someone's digging up info on Bill Cooper. So here's a, I'm going to print out the microfilms and it shoots out like a copy machine. Right. And you need to get the hell out of here. That was the library clerk. So I did. I beat feet nine blocks through a city I don't know. On foot, right through some crack neighborhood and everything, till I found a taxi and hauled ass. That's how intense it was in the months following, even. Wow! And so, ever since then, obviously, uh, operational security has been an important concern of yours. Um, you you've been serving our nation very. Um, and I'm, I say this with uh, you know a, a little trembling in my voice. I mean, obviously, you've had you've had concerns uh, for your own life. Have you still been followed ever ever since um, this incident occurred? Or are they still uh, trying to get to you somehow, some way? Oh yeah, and in 2011, it got really bad. Only in the sense that it, doing a bunch of East Coast workshops, mm-hmm. one week trainings. Right. Uh, suddenly, I was hit with that uh, heightened security list at Phoenix Airport on my initial flight, Mm. and they shut down the whole security checkpoint because of me. I was just trying to fly and teach a workshop on the Lodeal titles. (laughs) And uh, then at another driving checkpoint, I got hit in on the same like month whirlwind tour, and by now I'm in Ohio, Michigan region. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was a TSA Homeland Security checkpoint. Uh, everybody in the vehicle was clear until they got to me in the back seat. The vehicles diverted off the path and uh, went through three hours of interrogation. And I wouldn't break, so they got pissed off finally and just let me go. Because they'd say, like, well, who attends your workshops? I said, attendees. And they'd say, well, what kind of attendees? I'd say, well, the ones that signed up. Right. And And then they'd say, well, who signed up? I'd say, well, people that want to learn. You know, it went like that for three hours. <laughs> and these are so, federal authorities that are that are asking you these questions? Are they federal? Homeland Security and TSA. Homeland mm-hmm. Security. So the federal goons essentially are, you know, they're, they're trying to circumvent what you're trying to do, and that is to get out there, educate the public. You've been doing so. And by the way, we have, uh, let's, let's take about uh, 15 more minutes here. Thank you so much for staying over a, a little bit. Okay. But I, I want to I want to speed up the process here. You're still going around the country, and you're teaching uh, right now uh, sheriffs' departments uh, and city councils on how they can reclaim their land, the land that is uh, being managed by the federal government, the like the BLM territory, and saying, you know what, reclaim the land, take it for your use, and you're teaching that to jurisdictions across the country. Correct? Yes, and in fact, you're in my early work via email and first phone calls. Mm-hmm. I was 
doing the seminars with the, Nas- the National Constitutional Service Association. Yes. Remember that? Yes, sir. In California, Nevada, That's Oregon. Right. Mm-hmm. First contact you and I had ever had. Right. And uh, I was doing the county by county. After the big group one, uh, an all-day seminar on jurisdiction and delegation of authority mm-hmm. under the law uh, of all sheriffs and staff members and uh, other elected officials, then, then I broke off, and we had, you know, obviously planned. So then it was now go to each sheriff's individual county. Right. And then some I couldn't hit on that particular tour, if you will, because they were like in Michigan. But many of these sheriffs are the ones that you have seen on the news, on live on video or in reports that are, have been drawn the line, yes, saying sir. I have the jurisdiction, not you. Or, no, I'm not going to enforce gun bans because you don't have the jurisdiction. Right. I'm proud to say that uh, many of these popping up in articles are, the, are very people sitting in that workshop. Awesome. Constitutional sheriffs, uh, needless to say. Sheriffs and yeah. peace officers. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. And, and they're very successfully doing this, reclaiming their land from the federal government, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. A big part of it is the jurisdiction. And yeah. delegation of authority because maybe it's not a physical land but maybe it's a concept right like my own sheriff when he came in and and immediately got educated though was educating himself on the campaign trail mm-hmm. i'm proud that he went with me on many of these speaking engagements mm-hmm. and has in january again mm-hmm. my sheriff has right. i'm proud uh, of my navajo sheriff and he immediately when he entered office there's a thing called cross-certification, and it's the way that federal agencies wiggle their way into your counties and cities and states. They need that local authority, so they work and strive using the tool of that grant-making authority mm-hmm. and all sorts of other shit to carry it on the stick mm-hmm. to buy a cross-certification, essentially. Mm-hmm. And... So the first, one of the first things he did, and, I'm, and many sheriffs have now copied around the country, was he ripped up everything that was on file when he entered office. We're not cross-certifying any outside agencies to operate in our county. Right. That's, that's exactly what he told everybody. That's outstanding. And held it to this day and in his second term. Outstanding. That, and those yeah. are your efforts right now. That's your main focus is, uh, is still doing that. What, let, let me ask you this, okay, in the remaining moments that we have here. What, what is your biggest concern as to where we are as a, as a nation? I mean, obviously, we've got the constitutional sheriff stepping up. It's only a portion of them. It's a, unfortunately a small portion of them. Um, mm-hmm. and, and pushing out uh, the federal authorities, uh, what, what can our population of listeners right now do uh, to at least take some corrective action, just like you said, proactive, a proactive stance in their communities to push the feds back? What is the advice that you can give our listenership as to what they can do? We've done all the documentation, Pete, and we made this package deal that is so inexpensive. And we are fully, we choose to be fully donation supported. Mm -hmm. All they have to do is go to the website and uh, they can get the package deal where it's all the audio series Mm -hmm. on tactics, psyops, jurisdiction, delegation of authority, statehood, state sovereignty. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's hundreds of hours of broadcasting on a, D- a DVD, but they're MP3. Right, and that's... Uh, a, that that uh, is one great tool right there. The website and I need is... To look let me... in the mirror and, mm-hmm. and just make the decision. Am I going to be a spineless chief, or am I drawing the line here? Oh, yes. And that's, yeah. that's one of the first... And that's the hardest step for everybody. Let me let me make sure I give out. Uh, I want to make sure I give out the the web address. It's hourofthetime.com. and it has the entire uh, archive uh, of uh, of all of the episodes. I mean, dating back into the the mid nineties, uh, uh, Bill Cooper's first episodes that he ever broadcast. I've I've listened to. You can get a hold yeah. of the archives. Uh, you can get a hold of just about everything in the uh, in the research library. Ten thousand volumes and counting in the Hour of Time Virtual Research Library, on just about any topic uh, that is contained in your in your library. Now, I, I want to ask you about CAGI. Tell us about CAGI. CAGI and IS is still fully functional with many of the original founding members. And that library is actually for bona fide CAGI and IS members use only. Mm-hmm. 
and Veritas News Service staff. And uh, but uh, we occasionally have, you know, you have attrition like any any organization. So someone says, I can't do it anymore, or I got cancer, or I'm super old and dying, whatever mm-hmm. the case is. And we have, we occasionally allow new members in mm-hmm. through the normal processes. Sure. We have some new people applying right now. And those are the research arms around the country and, and around the world, actually. We have them on multiple continents. Uh, I get reports from Africa, Europe, uh, multiple countries in Europe, mm-hmm. North America, South America. And that's what feeds us our intel to constantly adapt to this attack. And CAGI stands for what? Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence. For Joint Intelligence. And IS staff stands for what? Intelligence Service. Intelligence Service. Outstanding. So it's a team of researchers, very responsible, well-educated. You said that some PhDs are actually uh, members of the staff, correct? Yeah, multiples, yes. Okay. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is really important here because if you actually go to the Hour of Time and you see that the Hour of Time Virtual Research Library, this 10,000-volume set... In just about every discipline that you can imagine, is this where this information is stored and available to the public? No, that's the private use library for the members. Okay. So people would have to go through the normal processes, the okay. backgrounds, the resumes, sure. the writing, sure. for it to be proofed. Uh, the normal things we've done since 93. Excellent. We're the only official CAD GIS there is, always has been, and we still follow the same normal protocols. The founding members and us, we all are going to stick to that. Yeah. We're not going to change it just so we can say, oh, we got 100,000 members. Mm-hmm. Then you get into the rule of squares, which just means you every time you exponentially increase your leaks, that's a proven fact in the military. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, and then plus you just start absorbing dead weight for the sake of numbers. That's exactly right. Quality. Um, we need quality. Let me uh, now ask you the all-important question, um, and, and, and Bill Cooper, uh, at, a, at a time in the late 90s, saw where our nation was going, and he saw that we were in collapse at that point, and I still believe that we were. This has been going on for decades now. It's been an oh, yeah. incrementalism uh, that has brought us to where we are today, but I think yeah. right now we are in full-blown collapse. We are almost in an undeclared state of martial law. Where do you think yeah. our nation is right now? Where do you think we're going? We are in the final throes of this full-blown implementation of communism, I believe. Do you agree with yeah. that? Yes, and if, if anybody wants to save and restore, and that's why I say restore our republic, uh, because we have to restore it because there ain't much of it left. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say save my republic. This isn't the first wave of attack. We're beyond that. I believe in my sincere research and belief, is that if we want to see a full restoration of our personal liberties, our republic, we have the next three to four years to stop and turn it around and begin the healing, or it will be unhealable. And you say it's going to take an additional three or four years of incrementalism, just breaking us down yeah. slowly but surely. Yeah. Okay. But they're torquing on the screws fast and well, oh, fast yeah. and furious. We can say that. But yes. they are. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, we see this this experimentation. I mean, we're like a bunch of lab rats. And when they take their homeland security radios and their multi jurisdictional stuff and they go into a city, like with the Boston Marathon bombing, and they are practicing uh-huh. implementing full blown martial law on a mass scale, are they not? Isn't that a practice session, the Boston Marathon uh, martial law? Oh, it was definitely, a, I guarantee you right now, everybody. Everybody involved is running around giddy uh, with their heads blown up and telling bullshit war stories about what they did on whatever day, and they're doing after-action reports, AARs, right now, and then you're going to see a heavy influx of infrastructure spending by anybody involved in that to buy more armament, more, more ammunition, and more elaborate training to fill any any gaps that they found uh, in their street sweeps. Hmm. They're going to use that experiment to accelerate their armament. It, it's, a, it's a state of quickening at this point. From, from what we've seen from the late 90s until now, 
everything is going to happen, even over this three or four period, three or four year period that you're that you're predicting it will take them to to fully implement it. It's still hyper speed exponential uh, growth of their system, is it not? Yeah, a month now would have been six months a decade ago. Yes, yes. In other words, and mm-hmm. I and I only give it three to four years because I qualified it with the words of "We will not recover." You won't ever have a republic or personal liberties back if we if we get that far. Yes, we've got this very narrow time frame mm-hmm. to start what's going to be a decade long healing period. A restoration again of our republic. Yes, sir. So you're looking at doing it, getting something started, and then another decade of trying to heal and turn around. Because think of it this way: think of that 46 percent of America that's on some kind of government payment mm. that you have got to over t- over, let's say, a 10 or 20 year period. Say, well, sorry, guys, but you're no longer going to be controlled with this welfare check mm-hmm. or this thing or that thing. So you're going to have to get out and do something. Quit pumping out babies and go get a job or whatever, right. depending on what area you study, you know, immigration, whatever. And uh, that's just not something you do overnight to a generation that is, uh, the technical term is habituated. And, and essentially on the payroll, yeah, they have been habituated. Yes. And uh, that's what they know. They don't know any better. They don't know any different. Yes, sir. So when you cut them off, suddenly, overnight, whatever, occurs in a collapse to start the healing, because you got to collapse to heal. We're yes. beyond just healing, trust me, in this republic, what's left of it. We're not just going to go, oh, okay, we got some good congressmen and senators now, and we're going to start healing the country. That's gone. We have to collapse at this point. We have to hit bottom, totally bottom, before we can restore this republic. And when we hit that bottom, what do you do with those millions of people on the dole, on the federal tit? Do yeah. you let them starve and riot in the streets? I mean, you see how it's going to compound? Yes, sir. So that, that's why I say it is still a, a, fab, a piece of the fabric still left that could be restorable. If it goes beyond the next three or four years, we're going to have lost another generation uh, since their big push started in the 80s right. will have lost a second one and as the communists have said or uh, actually it started getting promulgated during the French Revolution and all your folks running around with the Fijian caps of liberty in the French Revolution yes, sir. Uh, they knew then and they were proud of it Stalin and Lenin published it heavily give me two generations and let me get to that third generation and I'll control a country Oh yes, and sir, so that, that's where we're at, sir. What what is uh, right now to our listenership? What is the fix right now? What can you tell people? This is the fix. This is what we can do. This is the revolutionary change we need. What do we uh, need to do? What do you believe the fix is going to be for each and every individual that's hearing your voice right now? Okay, every individual needs to become as self sustaining as possible. I don't care if it's one marine battery. We've given classes on solar on the broadcast and in person. I don't care if it's one panel. You need a way to charge all your devices you like, or at least minimal communications equipment. Mm -hmm. You need to be self-sufficient in skills, so mental skills. Your brain's always with you. So don't just hog wheat and not not know how to use it, Mm -hmm. okay? If you are self-sufficient, you can't be pushed around. That has to be a priority. If you don't carry the Constitution in your back pocket like all of us do every day, plus have it memorized, Mm -hmm. you're not helping. Mm -hmm. And you need to learn your rights. Those are the three biggest facets I could see. Learn your rights. If you are not a victim, if you can't be, uh, if you can't be turned into a victim, Pete, take Katrina, take anything, Mm -hmm. then you're, you're not a puppet. And if you have millions of people across America that can say, you know, go to hell, Mr. Federale, piss off. I don't need your welfare check, or I don't need your store that's only got two days of food on its shelves. So play your game. Right. Then suddenly they don't have as much ground. They don't have a a good a step to launch from when you can't just be forced into a food camp. Yes, sir. Now, so learning, that's, that's the way learn, I see it. learning our rights, and, and, and I'd like to conclude on this very, very positive 
note, and I think you're going to agree with this. Knowing our rights, learning our rights and knowing our rights and knowing the Constitution and being self-sufficient is essentially right to the core of our being in that we were born here with certain inalienable rights. God gave us certain rights to defend ourselves, uh, to live freely outside of this enslavement. And, and, and we can each do that as individuals, and nobody can ever take that out of our brains or away from our bodies, right? Correct. That's absolutely right. Now, Doyle Shamley, I thank you so much uh, for, for all of your time. Uh, I thank you so much for everything that you've done uh, uh, for our nation in service of our, our country. And thanks for your time, and thanks, and good luck with uh, the Washington, D.C. meetings. All right, thanks, man. Oh, thank you so much.